May meeting on the 21st uh, of the month, and, uh, 2000, uh, May 2012. And as I uh, previously mentioned, our talk tonight is, uh, will be by myself in lieu of uh, Max and Bell, who originally had agreed to, uh, to present a little talk about his, his grandfather and his father and a little bit about his brother, and probably a little bit about himself. But uh, unfortunately, he uh, made a note that he's, just, he's the son of a, a chicken uh, hatchery man, and he chickened out. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I've been asked to do several talks lately, and at different talks, there's been uh, questions asked, and uh, and so I've had to do quite a bit of research. And when you look at all the things that you can now get on the internet, every second uh, thing you read uh, conflicts with the previous one. <laughs> the numbers are wrong, and and so I went to to Maston Bell when I came to to deal with the. Uh, the hatchery and the castle, I, I went to talk to Matt, who's one of the three boys in the Bell family, all grandsons of, of Peter Albany Bell, uh, who, who I knew and grew up with uh, in Mayland when I was a boy. <coughs> Maston was more my age, his younger brother Stuart and his older brother Reg, I knew them both well, in fact, uh, Reg had an engineering business and we did uh, a lot of castings for him. Unfortunately, we, we went out of cast iron and, uh, and Reg continued uh, using cast iron castings. And I'll get to that a bit later on, but uh, we moved away from cast iron. Reg continued and Reg did very well. Anyway, one of the first questions people asked about was, you know, Pineapple Inn. What did I know about Pineapple Inn? And, and was, uh, it was the old house that was on Gilford Road, was that the Pineapple Inn? And, or somebody even mentioned that, in fact, I was taking a group of uh, students from Curtin University through through Maynard's down 8th Avenue and we'd stop and, and I'd say, this was uh, Watts Produce Store, and a fellow uh, came along and he said, uh, why don't you take them down and show them you know, the real old part of Maylands down at uh, Williamson's Motor uh, Garage there, because that was the Pineapple Inn. And uh, well, I knew it wasn't the Pineapple Inn, but I didn't want to stop and argue with him in the of the street when I had about the <laughs> university students there. But there were obviously some people didn't know very much about my lands, they think, perhaps they do, and you're not always sure yourself. So I had to sort of sit down and, and get all my facts straight before I could uh, continue giving uh, talks about my lands. And exactly, you know, questions were asked, you know, where exactly was the pineapple in, and uh, so on. So, as I said, I talked to Masson and he didn't arrive tonight. <coughs> but uh, this gentleman, Peter Albany Bell, was from, uh, born in South Australia and he came to, uh, to Western Australia with his mother when he was 16. And his mother had, uh, had be been widowed. Uh, his father, a, a, a Scotsman, uh, had arrived in, in Adelaide in 1842 and married a, a girl called Jane Cray. Uh, and the father, he was named Peter Bell. I don't think there was any Albany in his name. He's one of the few in, uh, down the line that didn't have the name Albany in his uh, <coughs> name. But Peter Bell. Uh, there was talk of gold and Peter Bell went out looking for gold and he didn't ever return and he was never heard of again. 
you know, I don't know whether he did a runner or whether he uh, got lost somehow or what happened. That left uh, uh, Jane Bell with uh, two boys who uh, actually had already come to Western Australia because there was gold in 1882 and, and they left and come to Western Australia. So this young fellow at uh, 16 came to Fremantle with his mother and his mother opened uh, a little lolly shop in Fremantle. <coughs> and uh, this lad worked with his mother for six months and then they weren't doing that well so she said you better go and find a job. So he came up to the city uh, by train and the only, the only uh, stop between Fremantle and Perth was Subiaco in those days. And, uh, so he, he was coming to Perth and worked in, a, in a, another little uh, lolly shop. There was lolly shops around the place in those days. People were uh, obviously keen on lollies. So he sort of had a little bit of a background in, in confectionery and lollies. And that was not paying very well. He was getting five shillings a week. And he was offered a job in a draper's shop uh, in Hay Street, uh, when it was still a sand track, in fact, he says. And he worked uh, as a draper's assistant. And the fellow who owned the, the business also had a cattle station well, way out from Geraldton, almost out as far as Kew, was called Cool, not Cool Gardy, but Cool Kudadi Station. And he said to uh, young Peter, uh, about 17 by then, maybe 18, uh, you should do well if you if you went out and sort of roughed it up a bit and uh, got a job as a jackaroo, you know, you can have a job of working in the station. So his mother sewed 10 shillings into his coat and put him on the train and off he went to Geraldton. And the, the, uh, the owner of the station arranged for a horse to be at the police station. And so he, uh, he said, well, I don't know how to go. And the fellow said, well, this horse knows the way. And it was uh, over 100 miles. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you kick the horse in the ribs and the horse will take you to the station. <laughs> so that's, that's what he did. And uh, halfway out, he said he encountered the most terrible storm he'd ever endured. And uh, they, he got into a tree and sheltered from the storm with, and held onto the horse. <laughs> and when the storm abated, uh, he, he climbed back on the horse and again kicked it in the ribs and he continued on. And eventually he got out to the station. And he, he worked there for about three years. And in that time, he, he gained a, a very high respect for the Aboriginal people who were on the station. He loved them and, and he formed a sort of a lifelong association with, with Aborigines. And he, he sort of set out to improve. He, he, the conditions they generally lived in were pretty uh, much squalor and he, he made up his mind that he would do whatever he could to improve the lot of the Aboriginal people. So anyway, he returned to Perth in, uh, when he was 21, in 1894. And the first thing he encountered was a fellow standing on the corner of, outside the Wentworth Hotel on the corner of Murray and William Street, uh, selling lemon squash uh, by the glass. And he thought uh, he didn't have a job, and he thought, gee, I could do that. So he, he, he was pretty uh, much an entrepreneur, and he said, uh, I'll start my own shop, and I'll make lollies and, and sell lemon squash. So he, he went and found a shop in Hay Street, where Edmunds is now, and he began to rent the shop. And Madison tells me uh, from his grandfather that he would work all day in the shop, and he'd go home at night and squeeze lemons and make boiled lollies. 
and then he'd come in the next uh, morning and, and sell whatever he made and away he'd go again. So that's, that's how he started. Uh, so that was, and in, in a couple of years, it wasn't very long, he, he'd really got into the swing of this and he was, he was making money. And he realised that there was a need for these sort of places and also not just uh, lemon squash and boiled lollies, but he, he decided he'd, he'd go further and introduce a cafe or restaurants and he called them tea rooms. So he, he opened... Uh, oh, if I go through the list, you'd be amazed. And by 1912, so he's sort of back in just before the turn of the century, about 1898, he opens with a, with a shop. And in 1912, he's now got uh, 14, 14 shops. Couldn't believe it, but he's got uh, one, two, three in Hay Street in Perth, two in Barrack Street, two in William Street, one in Queen's Building, one in Wellington Street, one in Forest Street. Now, I don't know where Forest Street is. I don't know where uh, Forest Park. Forest Park. Forest Park. Forest Park. Forest Park. Forest That was called Cemetery Road, and then they changed it about 1900 to Forest Road. OK. Forest Road. Thanks. So it's Gone. in East Perth. East Perth. Oh, he had one in Hay Street, Subiaco. And he had uh, one in Hannon, no, he had two in Hannon Street, he had one in Birth Street, Boulder, and he had one in Thunder. So, in a short, you know, few years, and at, when he was like at the peak, when he had that many, he had 317 people working for him by then, 1912. And he was making real money. In fact, Mason tells me in one year, probably around about then, he made £120,000. Now that was, that was serious money. And money really wasn't of great concern to him anyway because he gave most of his money away. But uh, he was able to travel and he went on a trip. He'd heard of uh, the, the Bourneville... Cadbury's uh, factory in, in England and the Ghirardelli chocolate factory in San Francisco. So uh, he travelled over there and while he was there he, he saw, particularly in, uh, at Cadbury's, they, they built a, a beautiful uh, factory with a garden uh, complex and he learned uh, that they were sort of uh, providing something very special for their workforce in the way of uh, better than factory conditions. And he took that to, under his belt and he went to, uh, to San Francisco, as I said, and he saw this uh, Ghirardelli chocolate factory in San Francisco. And when you have a look at this, uh, in fact, this is a photo that I took a couple of years ago and I wasn't really that sure about where the design of this factory came from, the castle as we know it, but Ghirardelli uh, was a name that stuck in my mind because during World War II, all the kids of uh, Perth were invited down to Gloucester Park by the United States Navy and they put on what was known as a Jim Khan. It was a sort of a public relations uh, thing. And all the young people, Pam was there. I didn't know her then. Otherwise I might have got to know it earlier than I did. But uh, anyway, in a bag that was handed out to all the kids that were present were two bars of chocolate. And they had this name, Ghirardelli. It's an unusual name, an Italian name fellow who'd gone to San Francisco and started making chocolate uh, back in the 18, 1856, I think, and 
And actually, the factory's still running, but it's now owned by the Lindt and the Swiss chocolate company. They own it now. But anyway, we didn't get to the factory. We were at the Maritime Museum, which is just across the way from, from this building. But we could see it, and there's a big sign. You'll, if you have a close look at this, you'll read a big sign across the top near it down. And I said to Pam, you remember that name? That was the chocolates that the American sales gave us. Uh, two of those chocolate bars and a bottle of Coca-Cola, which we'd never seen before. Of course, we'd never seen these uh, American chocolates before either. Yeah, Coca-Cola. Yeah, that's right. But it, I, I remembered the name so well because we had this chocolate bar and never seen it uh, before. And uh, so when, when I saw this building, I took a photo of it, and uh, and when you look closely, you, you can see uh, some of the striking the striking sort of resemblance of, the, of where he might have got the idea of that castle. The, the castle. And, uh, yeah, he's got the same sort of thing and the battlements and that sort of thing. Castellation. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. From there. So anyway, jumped ahead of myself a bit. This this fellow uh, was was going a hundred miles an hour. He uh, he's got uh, now he's got about fourteen or fifteen of these tea rooms around the, the state, and he took a couple of partners, and he got involved in all sorts of uh, um, voluntary work. He became uh, all right, I'll go through the list. He became a justice of the peace, and that uh, enabled him to sit as a magistrate in the children's court. And he was vitally interested in welfare of young people. He uh, he led the fight for the first widow's pension, and he was successful in gaining a pension of seven and sixpence a week for widows and, and he was they say he was uh, responsible for, for that uh, endeavor he was a foundation member of the ymca and he was also on the board of directors he was on the board of the perth hospital it says perth hospital it must have gained the royal uh, name later on at that time, there was uh, there was an apple and uh, pear board, and any fruit that didn't come up to standard, they used to uh, destroy, they bury it. And he felt that there was need for some of the uh, particularly Ab Aboriginal missions that uh, he he felt they could use the fruit. They weren't perfect, so uh, the apple and pear board weren't prepared to sell it in the shops. They would they would they would bury it. So he convinced them to, to let him take the fruit and he, and he delivered it to all around, uh, pretty well all around the state to all, the, all those orphanages and uh, Aboriginal missions. And he, he convinced the West Australian Government Railways to, to let him uh, have freight free. So he was able to send uh, this, this fruit to all missions around Western Australia. He was a foundation member of the Silver Chain. Uh, he went to uh, World War I as a volunteer working for the YMCA between 1916 and 18. And I'll, I'll get back to the, the castle a bit later. He was chairman of the Master Caters Association and he had a great involvement with the Church of Christ. He was the secretary, he was the chairman, a deacon emeritus, he was the Sunday school superintendent of the, of the uh, Church of Christ for 28 years. Uh, and there's written about him that uh, with his initiative and enthusiasm, uh, he was an inspiration. And he firmly believed that the great and chief responsibility of life is to spread 
uh, the, the word and the knowledge of the truth of Christ. That was his, uh, his philosophy. That, that's really what he was, was meant to be on earth to do. And cakes. <laughs> yeah. He, and, he made, and he made heaps of money. He was very clever. But we'll get to what he did with his money a bit later on. Now, he had, uh, he had nine children. Uh, I said he'd done well. He's made quite a lot of money. And he bought the property that was known as the pineapple, or some of the property that was known as the pineapple estate, uh, the park on Guildford Road from Thirlmere up to, you, you, you probably know the Gables, it's about a 10 or 12 storey high rise uh, development. He, he owned all that land from Thirlmere up to the end of the Gables uh, property. And, in, and he bought that in 1909. He, he built this house. He had nine children. Well, one had died, so he had eight children when he built the house. And he built this magnificent house uh, in 1912. But the old Gables house? Well, he called it Piney. He called it Piney. It wasn't Pineapple Inn, but he, he called it Piney. But that's the old Gables house. Yeah, it's where the Gables is now. Yeah. Yep. It's exactly where the Gables is now. They they knocked the house down and built the Gables, which is a shame because it's a magnificent house. He had two tennis courts uh, alongside the house. And two years later, 1914, he'd been to America and seen uh, Ghirardelli and, and uh, Cadbury in, in Bourneville. And he built this, the castle. And you'll see here there's women in, uh, in white uniform. He provided uh, his staff with, with uniforms. He was a man before his time. He, when there was, uh, the, the law was uh, to provide a week's leave for employees, he gave everyone an extra week. He provided two weeks leave. And not only that, the people who worked in the gold fields, he, he paid their fare and accommodation to come to Perth uh, for a week's holiday. And he provided the people who worked in Perth with a fare to travel within 150 miles of the city. So uh, he, he believed uh, really that the staff were, were of course the most important part of his business, which was rightly so, and he treated them accordingly. They were able to use the tennis courts for recreation, they had garden facilities, and uh, uh, he was a pretty clever man. He, every Wednesday, and my uncle was uh, his bookkeeper, and he had a meeting, and all, every business had to provide their, all their accounts after the end of the week, and he had to have them Wednesday morning and Wednesday afternoon. He had a meeting and he knew exactly how much money each business uh, had made in the previous week. So he had his finger right on the pulse. If the business wasn't doing well that week, he'd want to know why and do something to, to rectify it. Uh, can't imagine how he was able to do that. But he said about, you know, Built, he built this castle, he built the north, there was two, two wings, there was a north and south, and then he built across the front. But he, he built, uh, first of all, in 1914, he built the first uh, wing. He moved, he, he'd already established a factory in, in Bulga Street, close to the city. And he was working out of there, but as the business grew, he needed to uh, to go bigger, and so he bought that property on Guildford Road, built the first part. Then he went to the war for two years, came back and built the rest of the uh, the building. And, and so the building, as it stands today, uh, was completed in 1919, and uh, it all went pretty well. Unfortunately, there, there came a, a depression and things started going downhill uh, and he decided uh, there were a couple of issues. One was with uh, 
he, he had thought he'd done pretty well with with his staff, but perhaps others weren't. He, the, the union at the time decided to go on strike for a month, and they stayed out after a month. And he said to the union, but, you know, I've done everything I can for my employees. He said, you know, you're going to break me because he said, I can't keep this factory in, uh, running. And uh, things had started to show signs of, of a depression. And so in 1929, uh, he said, well, this is, must have been uh, intended. And so he shut the business down. And uh, <clears throat> so that was the end of, of that particular uh, operation in the, in the castle. Albany Bell uh, decided he'd, he'd do what he wanted to do most of all. He, uh, he swapped this building for... for uh, several thousand acres of land down at Rollins. And he had uh, discussions with a fellow called Castillo, who owned this property in Rollins, and they sat down at one night at the table, and on a piece of paper, they wrote uh, that they would exchange without any money or any uh, real estate agents or anything else. And they would exchange this house for this property in Rollins. And they wrote on a piece of paper the agreement and shook hands and that was that. No money, had, had no, nobody else intervened. It was just simply the, the two uh, owners. So he went off to Rollins and he immediately established uh, on part of the land, and had some buildings there, and he established uh, like an Aboriginal mission. And uh, he had uh, some families came and lived, but didn't work out. There were, there were many fights, and uh, in the end, I think at that time they may have been taking uh, what they call the lost generation, and so they agreed that uh, the government allowed that he could take uh, ch young children, and I think he had uh, about 18 young uh, stolen generation kids. Yeah, like Sister Kate's home. He, he had some people who, her, who he had uh, looking after them, like uh, house parents. And he had about 18 of these young kids. And he, he'd, he'd gone to America and made a study of uh, juvenile delinquency. He'd uh, been to Colorado where the it was evidently a world authority there, a fellow called uh, Ben Lindsay, I think his name was. And he went and, and worked uh, with him and understood uh, how to uh, work with delinquent children. And he gave part of the, the property uh, to sort of the church, really, to, to operate as an orchard, again providing food or fruit for uh, uh, like Aboriginal missions around, around the state. And again, the West WA government railways provided free transport and he was sending off 16 cases of fruit a week to different missions around uh, Western Australia. And uh, in the end, when he was uh, too old to, to work on the place. He uh, he gave it. In fact, he gave it to the to the church really to uh, to operate as a, as a mission. So he came back and he built he built a house uh, at the back of as we now know the facade is still there of the chicken hatchery. Now the chicken hatchery uh, was operated by Peter Albany Bell's son. Albany Maston Bell, who was the father of the young fellow who was young fellow, he's older than me a couple of years, but he was the guy who was supposed to be here tonight, or I thought he might have come. So Peter Albany Bell had uh, 
remember I said I think he had eight, nine in fact, but one died, he had eight children. And two of the girls from, uh, from his marriage, he, he married a girl, he left Adelaide or South Australia, he was brought up in the country around Clare. If people know where Clare is, it's just north of Adelaide in the hills, beautiful country. And there was a family there that he'd known, the young girl, uh, Clark was their name, and he went back and he married uh, uh, Edith, Edith Clark <coughs> in Adelaide, and then came back and, and then he, he built this place. You know, well, he built that place a bit later, in fact, he, much later, 10 years or so later. But Maston Bell was his eldest son, and he'd worked with, the, with his father making cakes and bread and confectionery and chocolate and ice cream. And he'd built this place uh, after seeing uh, the two factories, one in San Francisco and one in, near Birmingham in England. Uh, it took all their, as many ideas as he could get from them and he built one area where he could uh, work with chocolate and they needed to keep it cool and he built it with two cavities, like not just a, like a cavity wall, but three walls, so that there were uh, two cavities. And it, it was uh, ideal, uh, maybe it was, he'd seen that in, in England as well, perhaps, I don't know. But anyway, in that building, uh, I don't know whether it's still there, because later on, of course, the building got, uh, came, uh, fell into disrepair, and it almost fell down, and the people who owned it at that stage weren't prepared to, uh, to maintain it uh, because they couldn't see any future in what it could be used for, and they were going to just let it fall down. And eventually, uh, well, as most people know, it became a, a residential development. It was absolutely gutted and I was on the local council at the time and, and I was happy to uh, allow that to happen. We insisted that they, they retained the external uh, facade of the building but whatever they wanted to do inside the building, uh, whatever they had to do to, to maintain the building, we, we'd be happy with. So they virtually gutted that building and they built uh, other walls and turned it into residential units and I, I'm sort of always happy with that decision because oh, yes, yes. the building stands uh, proud today and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 I still remember when I was, when I was you know, back in the 60s that it looked fairly smart and had lawns at the front and it looked like it was being used for something. Well, it, it was used for a lot of things, uh, David. During, uh, he, he closed the building down in uh, 1930. There was no, nothing happened uh, as far as the, uh, the uh, factory for confectionery and cakes and all the stuff that he was making, chocolates. And he leased sections of it to different people. There was one company called Fergie's. I think in those days there were probably only two to uh, breakfast foods, there was Wheaties and Fergies. And Fergies actually was made in the factory. Uh, it was before, you know, we've got Uncle Toby's or Wheat Pix, maybe it was Wheat Pix, but uh, anyway, Fergies operated out of there for a while. There was a macaroni factory, fellows had the front part, manufactured macaroni. That went, nothing happened there for a while, then those things sort of started. And then came World War II, and WA newspapers bought the building, and they set up uh, a second printing system in, in the building. Uh, the idea was that if, if the city was bombed, they had an alternative to uh, <coughs> be able to continue printing the paper, so they had, they had to, and they actually printed two, uh, there were two papers in Perth then, it was the West Australia and the Daily News, and they printed two copies of the Daily News to make certain uh, that the plant operated okay. And then after after the war, they uh, 
they sold it off again. And uh, there, were, there were a number of different things operated there. There was a crowd called Gibsons, the uh, four brothers actually. They, they operated uh, a confectionery business there. They made, <coughs> made lollies. Uh, there was a crowd called uh, Bramac, made plastic raincoats. They worked uh, out, of, out of there. And then eventually the Department of Civil Aviation took the building over and uh, it became workshops for the Department of Civil, A Civil Aviation, Civil Department of Transport, and then another name. They, they changed their name three times while they were there, but they, they did all the maintenance on aerodromes and uh, all fire engines yes, and everything right. to do with uh, the aerodrome. So smart, the building uh, then was was bought again, and the owners couldn't find anything really that they could make any money out of. Uh, pardon me. So they applied to to do some knocking down of walls and uh, and do up the, the internal part of the building, and so it uh, came to life again. And. Uh, yeah, it seems as though it's, it's uh, still going pretty good and I know some people who actually live there and they're very happy living in that, uh, in that place. So, round about the time when uh, well, Peter's son, Albany Maston Bell, he'd, uh, when they closed the factory down in 1929, he, he started making... Uh, he opened a little shop in Oxford Street in Leadable, and he wasn't doing much good at that. And his father said, you should uh, get into hatching chickens. That could be a, a pretty good business. And so uh, he'd, he'd been to America again. His father was, as I said earlier, he's an entrepreneur. He kept uh, making trips to England and Europe and America and picking up ideas wherever he went and he could see that there was a, a, an industry that his son uh, Masson. So he started in 1938 uh, operating out of a tin shed at the back of the castle and he, uh, he worked there uh, and it was in a s system that was terribly labour intensive that the incubators they had were uh, meant that they uh, they had to turn the eggs twice in 24 hours, and uh, I know at one stage they they they, they sold uh, 250 thousand chickens in four months. So every night they they would have to do this, and it, it, Masson said uh, he worked with his father. Uh, at times when they were very busy up till three o'clock in the morning, they'd have to go and turn these, these eggs, uh, as I said, twice in 24 hours. And, and that, uh, they were making money, so he decided to build uh, the Elden Bell Hatchery, as we now know and see the facade there. Uh, they, his father built that on some of the, still on the same, land that his grandfather had bought and in 1942 he, he built that uh, hatchery and it's it's now here it's listed as well as the castle and uh, it, it's one of the very few well it's an art I think they, they recognize it as an art deco building it's one of the few factories uh, there's not much better though, is it here it's only the facade in fact uh, yeah, he, he Maston, uh, he can't understand why they uh, insisted on, on making them retain the facade. He said, no, that building, he said, uh, I came home from school one day, he said it was up to uh, top of the window height. He's, and he said, when I left in the morning, that's how it was. When I came home in the afternoon, he said it was flat on the ground. He said, uh, you know, the building wasn't worth two bob, but maybe they, they built it a bit stronger the second time. That's, uh, he said, I can't understand why they made them save that building. But 
the Heritage Council believed that there was some importance to saving it. It was a factory that was built uh, different to, to most of the other factories in, in Perth, and uh, it had some uh, it had some value, historic value, and so it's been it's been uh, made to be retained. So, uh, but. Uh, there were, there were, uh, I mentioned there were two. This gentleman had eight children. Two of the girls uh, actually married farmers and went to Wadi Forest. Now, Wadi Forest is a place where our friend Gus Levy, uh, where he finished up farming, uh, up where and Judith and Rod uh, are not here tonight, but that's where they have a farm as well. And, uh, and probably uh, Judith and Rod. Uh, are well aware of the fact that there's two of Albany, Albany Bell's daughters who actually went and married farmers in, in that area. So that was rather interesting. There, there's a lots, lots of little things that uh, you pick up when you read about it. The, you know, they talked about uh, sending chickens through MMA and we pick it up, we're reading stuff about MMA that's McRobertson Miller Airlines because we're interested in the aerodrome and so on. And in some of the things there, we find that I think in 1960, 1961, uh, Albany, Mast and Bell sent uh, 1,600 chickens to Broome. And it was an experiment. They were providing uh, Freight for uh, MMA had just begun providing freight to uh, uh, perishable goods to to the north. It had been a problem until then. Maybe they, I don't know. Maybe they were now working with refrigeration, keeping things cool. And he sent a consignment of 1,600 chickens to Brew. And uh, in the MMA report says that in. Uh, <coughs> In October, this consignment of chickens went to Broome, and in January there were 1,573 chickens had survived. So after six months, uh, they'd only lost 27 chickens. So that was a great success, and they continued then to send chickens uh, from the hatchery in Maylands uh, out to, uh, to the north. Uh, so... Peter Albany Bell had eight children. His oldest son built the hatchery and he had five children. The oldest boy was Reg Bell and Reg built an engineering uh, shop. Uh, they were incredible people. They, they were so hard working. Uh, Reg worked himself to death actually. He, he, he built he, he started, he served his time as a veteran journal of Tomlinson's in East Perth. He started making bricks because he intended to build his own factory when he was 17. Uh, when he finished his time, he built his factory with the bricks he already had made. Uh, and he built the factory, he started, actually he started uh, working in the carport of the, of the hatchery, which of course was virtually in between this building and the hatchery, which is, which is here. So Reg built, uh, started his, his own business in, in a little carport there with a lathe, and then he had already made the bricks and he built, he built the, uh, the building with his bricks uh, next to that. It, it, he, he expanded, as I said, he, he went 100 miles an hour. He finished up out on Collier Road in, uh, in Bassendine. He was bought out by a, uh, in, an international company. And when he died, he died pretty young, but he never had a holiday. He worked seven days a week, and he left $90 million for the didn't do him a lot of good because he died fairly early and uh, left his kids uh, with a heap of money. But uh, the, other, the other boy that, that I knew was more my age, his name was Maston Bell, grandson again of, of uh, 
Peter Albany Bell. He served his, his apprenticeship as a fitter and turner as well. And he, he had an incredible story as well. They're, they're all remarkable people. Uh, Maston uh, did an apprenticeship, went to work for a company uh, who were doing a lot of refrigeration repairs and, and they made him, uh, well, didn't make him, but they wanted him to, to look after that side of their business and so he did a course and uh, probably they sent him away to, to learn but he, he went to, I don't know, to technical college and became uh, uh, qualified as a refrigeration mechanic and he worked for that company as a refrigeration mechanic and then a business came on the market of a, a motor dealership in Condon, a Ford dealership with a workshop. He, he thought that's right up my alley. So he went out and uh, he actually leased the building for three years, the, 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 comp the company from the guy who owned it. And he finished up, he, he bought the, 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 the business. So it was a, a Ford franchise fairly small, a workshop, and uh, so he needed to, uh, to become a motor mechanic as well then. So he went again to uh, technical college and he, he became qualified as a motor mechanic. And so he was <laughs> operating his engineering business, he had the motor mechanic and he had the business. He, 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 he never stopped, and in fact he's still working. But he, 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 uh, he continued doing studies and, and doing courses and he became qualified as a plumber and gas fitter. He had a license, he's got a license for that. He became a qualified electrician and he's got a license for that. Uh, he, he's a motor mechanic. What's he still working at? He said, I work full time for my kids. He said, uh, I, I, I do every job they, they've got. He said, they buy old houses and I, I do them up for them. He said, I do everything. He said, I do flooring, I do tiling, I do uh, whatever. He said, plumbing, electrical. He said, anything that they need doing, he said, I do. And, he, he, and it was one of the reasons why he gave that he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't come. He said, oh, look, I, I work all day. By the time I get home, he's 81. He said, I'm... Um, Tired and you know, just not do it. He said, "I'll give you, a, I'll give you a few photos and, 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 and tell you what I know, and uh, you, you do the rest." So unfortunately, yeah, that's that's what's happened tonight. I would have preferred that he uh, he'd come along. But uh, folks, that's that's pretty well the the story of of, of Albany Bell, a remarkable man uh, and a remarkable family. Uh, beautiful house, demolished to make way for the gables, the, uh, the old castle that uh, Pineapple Inn was knocked over to, uh, to build, and a uh, photo uh, that I'm glad I took of, of uh, Ghiardelli uh, Chocolate Company in uh, San Francisco. So I'll just... There's a lot of land next to the castle. There was a big court case on it. Well, the company that bought the land, I think, is, a, is, is a, an Asian company. Uh, they wanted to do a development, and they didn't want to... Uh, actually, the council of the day said they should retain that building. The Heritage Council, as well, declared it to be heritage listed, and they, they walked away. They said they, they, they didn't want to do a development and leave that building because they there was originally an idea where they would do a residential a residential development on the site, they'd keep the building and make it a gym, gymnasium, sort of a sports hall for the rest of the development. But then they said, no, it's too hard, we, we can't, we'd rather knock it down and uh, part of it fell there. So there wasn't also enough place for the herd that mm. uh, more than now we have to ask for a hundred meters from the river and the towns forgot to do that? Well, I don't, I don't know. They, they've never been able to uh, do a development. But uh, 
there. So I don't know where it stands now. They, they, the facade, the rest of the building fell down. They made them shore up the facade and said, you at least you're going to have to keep the facade. Uh, there might be a court case now where they're trying to argue that uh, that shouldn't be necessary. But uh, yeah, so I honestly don't know. I haven't. I haven't uh, kept in touch with them along the council. So, uh, falling down. That's how right. Can, how can the council or anybody else demand from people who pay a lot of money for the right. way? It's a difficult one. have to keep their own, own yep. building there. That's right. It's very difficult. And, uh, you know, there is a school of thought that the government, if they insist on the Heritage Council uh, 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 maintaining the or asking for a building to be saved, they should provide yes, money, and they place. don't do that. And so it's a, it's a very, use. very if controversial you point. Folks, I think that's about all I can offer. Unless anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask, and maybe I can answer. But if not, we'll. Uh, how much school did he have? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, because I've mentioned that once. <laughs> he had one year of formal school. Mind you, his, his father was a school teacher, and so he, uh, he probably had some home school. But he actually went to school for one year. But uh, he, uh, he sure learned uh, a lot in a year. <laughs> he was a remarkable man. And he, every, whatever he did, for instance, he was involved heavily in the, in the Church of Christ, and he would go to, they definitely have a conference every year somewhere in the country, and he would go and he became the, the chairman of the conference. And he, that went on for years and years and years. So he was sort of regarded as the, the top man in, in their particular religion. And then his son, Maston, he virtually mirror, mirror image his, his father in, in the church. In fact, Maston tells me that his father, Maston Albany Bell, or Albany Maston Bell, was more fanatical with the religion than, than this gentleman. He said his father, he said in fact, he said he, he would have given, he said he had, he'd made a lot of money, he said he would, he would have given half his money to the church. He said he, he helped them with buildings, he fitted out new churches, uh, he, he was happy. He, in fact, uh, I think I read where, you know, they were both of a similar m mindset. They, they believed that they were, they were put on earth to, to sort of uh, spread the word of the Lord and, uh, and whatever money they, 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 they believed that they only needed enough money to, uh, to live on and whatever they earned up, had over that then uh, was meant to do some good with. And there was one part of their story that, that wasn't uh, really good. He had quite a bit of money from the, made money from the chicken hatchery and he, he invested with a crowd called uh, Reed Murray. Reed Murray, whatever they yes. were, like a finance company. And in 1961, I think it was, Reed Murray went to the war. Yes. And they lost, uh, they lost half their money. He said, so my dad didn't finish up with anything. He said he gave half his, whatever he made in his life, to the church and the other half to Reed Murray. He said, so he said, we finished up with virtually uh, with nothing from, uh, and the old fellow, uh, he gave most of his money again to the church for missions and uh, for that sort of thing. So they uh, they were pretty genuine people. They certainly were. Yeah. Folks, is there any anyone with anything I could perhaps answer or no? Look, well, on that note, thank you very much, Terry. The uh, research that you've done, I know you've probably lived with it, but. Um, the, nearly an hour you've talked about uh, right? today, yeah, and it's been a really good talk. Yeah. Thank well, you very much. I think we should all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
coming from the bush, coming down, that uh, building always caught the eye. Yeah. Well, it, it's a remarkable building. It certainly has a lot of a lot of history attached. But you know, uh, the internet is fantastic. You can you can learn so much from it. But every different person who has a story to tell on the internet, you get a different story. Yeah. For instance, they talk about one, and I'll, I'll have it here somewhere, one part that I've got from the internet by one writer will say that in fact there were a hundred people employed by Albany Bell. And another will say there were four hundred. And his grandson says no, the most he ever had was 317. I've got the figure exactly what he had. And then you'll find that they'll say he had 13 uh, tea rooms. And he did. He had 13 in Perth. But then he had uh, two in Kalgoorlie, one in Boulder, and uh, one in Bunbury. So, uh, you know, every time you, you read something, then you think, oh, that doesn't read right. Go and read something else. And, and then, it, as I said, I finished up going to uh, to the old fellow's grandson, and uh, and he sort of helped me with with some of the uh, yeah, material. Some of the versions of the pineapple in the reason that it was called the pineapple in that was there. Yeah, well, the pineapple in you know is part of Mayland's history. It, I'll mention it briefly, but the pineapple in uh, the area where this these buildings are was called the Pineapple Estate, and. Uh, it, it came about by a fellow in 1832, he came out and he got a grant of land in that area, Mercy Hospital between there and the Mayland Yacht Club in that area, right down to the river. And he called the land Pineapple Estate. And there's stuff written about that where in 1827 when Stirling came up the river, they saw what they thought were pineapples growing on the land and they and they mentioned that in dispatches that there were pineapples growing there. And then we've got a letter in our office here that talks that uh, is from John Gregory, son of uh, the fellow that actually bought the land. He came out with his father and he said his father had bought a pineapple from England and he planted the pineapple near the river and the pineapple grew well and his father called the property Pineapple Estate. So that's the, that's the story that uh, I think you'd have to, well I find that more reliable than, than the other one, but I think that's pretty definite. The son's written home uh, back to England to say, my father, has, has planted the pineapple, the pineapple's grown well, and he's called the, the area Pineapple Estate. And then, you know, he built a, an inn on the Guildford Road where the castle is now. They, they knocked that pineapple inn down to build a castle, and uh, that was the pineapple inn. But it was interesting because Masson tells me that his grandfather, Peter Albany Bell, called this place the Pine Inn. Uh, and somebody said to me, oh, that must have been the Pineapple Inn. But it, it certainly was never the Pineapple Inn. And then this fellow, I, as I said, I mentioned, he, he was on 8th Avenue and he told me to take these people down and so tell them the real history of my lands where uh, Williamson's Motor Garage, because that was the Pineapple Inn. And uh, I said, look, I haven't got time to argue with you now, but... Uh, uh, you know, perhaps another time we'll argue about that. Is that all the garage? Yeah, it was. It built in 1930. It's, it's sort of not that old. You know, I <laughs> think it's old, but it, it, it was built in 1930. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't, uh, of course, owned by Williams and <laughs> And in fact, next to that shop, or next to that garage, there was, a, there was two shops. And uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that perhaps another time. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah.